let's go ahead and open up to Ephesians. Ephesians 3 to 14 uh, is an amazing passage. Uh, it's one of those passages that really uh, there's no reason why all of us, if we can't memorize it word for word, we can kind of just memorize it generally because uh, it's an amazing section. And what I've been doing every week that I've been teaching uh, is kind of going over the broad uh, passage as a whole. Uh, it's very easy. This is a very condensed pas pa passage, uh, and it would be very easy. You could almost do a week or two study on every phrase, maybe even every word in this passage. Uh, but the problem with that, we're going to be doing part of that, but the problem with that, if that's all you do, you kind of lose sight of the forest uh, because all you see are the trees. So what I'm going to begin with is first an overview. And I've done this in two or three different ways. Each way I try to do it a little differently uh, to bring out different aspects so that we become so familiar with this passage uh, that when we go to look at all the individual trees, uh, which we've started to do, uh, we won't get lost in the forest. So let's go ahead and open up. Let's begin with verse 3 here. This blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and the question is, what the question he wants us to ask, why blessed be the Father? Why is the Father praiseworthy? Why should we praise him, eulogize him, speak well of him? And he goes on in this verse to say, uh, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at uh, this uh, given look at this as an overview. Basically, the first 14 verses, verses 3 to 14, are going to take every phrase in verse 3. Uh, they're going he's going to look at in Christ and he's going to tell you what that means. He's going to look at in the heavenlies. He's going to tell you what that means. He's going to look at all blessings uh, and make use of that. So we're going to go through and just kind of uh, broaden out verse 3 here as we go through. So uh, the question is, uh, verse 3, he's going to take that. If, that's like the gemstone verse. And he's going to hold it up now, and he's going to put it in the light a little differently to get the different, uh, different resonances of that light, the facets of the glory of this. And he's going to look at every one of the phrases and bring out the glory that's involved in that. So as we go through this, he wants you to be thinking readers. He doesn't want to, you see, religious systems don't want you to think. They just want you to recite and repeat and say what they say uh, and then go home and think you've done something called worship. Uh, but God, that's not why God and Paul have written this. They want us to think with, uh, with them. Uh, and the question is, why should we praise God? And he answers that here because he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. And now Paul's going to go on to enlarge on each one of those phrases, all those major phrases. And that brings us to the first one, why in Christ? Why does this have to be in Christ? And that's going to be answered in verse 4. Verse, and we've looked at verse 4 uh, and dealt with it quite a bit the last couple messages, so I'm not going to redo that. Uh, hopefully we'll remember some things from that on this chosen concept. But according as he hath chosen us in him, us in Christ. Uh, what, the way you need to read this verse is he doesn't say here, chose us to be in Christ. He doesn't say uh, anything like that. That's what theological systems say. They say God's talking here about election unto salvation, uh, and God chooses some people to be saved, some people to not be saved, some people will believe, some people won't believe, depending on his election. Uh, that's not anything about what this verse is about. Uh, we're going to read it, uh, and, and I wrote an article uh, after the last message here a couple of weeks ago in the email I sent out, and several people got back to me and, and really liked uh, how this was illustrated, so I'll do that again today. But here I just want to introduce it. It's chosen, he has chosen us, excuse me, see I'm already saying it the wrong way. He has chosen us in Christ. It's the group. It's the us in Christ. And we'll look at a real practical example of that. In eternity past, he says, before the foundation of the world, uh, he chose us in Christ uh, to be his holy, sanctified, set apart. Uh, holy just means set apart for God's purposes. 
It just means something God's taken uh, and he's going to use it for his own purposes. Uh, and so we're his holy. What God has done today, why this is in Christ, is because God chose us in Christ to be his set-apart vehicle of service today in the dispensation of grace. And we could even take it a step further. Why in Christ? Because that's where we, re we are placed, where we are blameless. Uh, we're set apart in Christ. We're set apart in his vehicle of service. And as members of his vehicle of service, the body of Christ, members of his body, uh, we as believers, we are placed there blameless. Not because we are blameless in ourselves, but because we're blameless in Christ, because of what Christ did on the cross uh, for us. Uh, and so why in Christ? Because in eternity past, God chose us in Christ to be his holy, sanctified, set-apart vessel of service in the dispensation of grace, because having received the love of God at the cross of Christ by faith, that's what happened at that cross. God gave the extreme, uh, extravagant, overflowing, superabounding, uh, exceedingly greatness of his love at that cross where Christ died for his enemies, us, his enemies. Uh, what an amazing thing. You're only going to find that in Pauline Grace Mystery Truth. You're not going to find that truth in John. You're not going to find that truth in First or Second Peter. You're only going to find that truth in Pauline Grace Mystery Truth, uh, that death for sinful enemies. Uh, and we've looked at that in the past. But Christ, and by faith, we receive the love of God at the cross of Christ. Uh, and there in Christ, we're stand in a right standing before God, blameless through the, what Christ did for us on that cross. So that's why it's in Christ. Uh, then we get to the next verse, verse 5. The, and he's going to develop a, a, another aspect of verse 3, those all blessings. Well, why does he need to give us all blessings? Uh, why does that need to be all? Uh, and that's what he's going to answer here in verse 5. There's a reason why he's giving us all blessings. He didn't give all blessings to Israel under the law according to the flesh uh, back at Sinai. He didn't give them, give them that. Uh, as a matter of fact, in Romans 9, Paul says he went through all those blessings God promised Israel and they haven't been fulfilled yet. He's already given us all blessings. Now, why does, did he need, uh, to, or why did he choose to give, why did he predetermine, I guess, to here to use the verse uh, in verse 5, why did he predetermine, predestine, uh, to give us all spiritual blessings? Look at verse 5. Having predestinated us, that just means predetermined unto a certain destiny, us unto the adoption of children, uh, that's what our King James says. We need to use, from my previous messages on multiplicity, we need to add a little multiplicity here. If you look at the new King James, uh, you'll see the real word there is sons. It's adoption of sons, adoption as sons or adoption of sons, uh, as what is really brought, being brought out there. What's brought out is our sonship position. Now, hopefully everyone here knows this sonship position uh, concept. It's that God brings us into his family as adult sons and daughters. Now, there's a whole difference. If you, you bring a child, a baby, into your family, adopt them the way we, we use the term in modern, day, in, modern day, in modern times, adopt a baby into another baby, can that baby do, participate in the father's business? No, he's just a baby. He's just a toddler. Uh, he's not going to participate. You put him in the nursery with tutors and governors, like God did with the nation of Israel. But that's not what he's doing with us today, Paul says. Today, he's brought us into the family when we believe, all that believe in the dispensation of grace are placed in Christ, in the body of Christ, as members of his body, uh, and we are brought into his family as adult sons and daughters. And the reason for that, the concept behind that whole uh, sonship position, is that then we can immediately begin participating in the Father's business. We can immediately begin uh, accessing the Father's riches. We can immediately begin 
uh, participating as things, advancing his plan and will and program. We can do that all right up front. That's a wonderful thing. That, and uh, it's just an amazing thing that he's fully equipped us to carry out what he wants us to do. <coughs> what he wants us to do. In eternity past, God predetermined that all believers, us in Christ, uh, would be uh, brought into his family as adults, sons and daughters, fully equipped to participate in the Father's uh, business. And all of this, let's finish the verse here at the end of verse 5, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. All of this is just because it brought good pleasure to God. So now let's just turn that a little bit. Uh, shouldn't that, this plan, this program, give us good pleasure? Uh, if it's giving good pleasure, if it's pleasing the Father because it accomplishes something good, uh, and shouldn't we appreciate what this is? Uh, and so it's just all this just because turning ungodly sinners on enemy status before God, uh, idol worshiping, mostly Gentiles, but uh, everybody in the world who believes, uh, just a bunch of idol worshiping, dead, uh, sin captured, uh, all that. And he brings us, and you know what he does? Just for his good pleasure, he makes us the radiators of his glory the reflectors, the displayers of his glory. A bunch of dead sinners on enemy status before him, he saves them just by grace through faith uh, and makes them the reflectors and radiators of his glory. That's what God is accomplishing in this dispensation of grace. What an amazing thing. There's no better uh, thing to be involved in in the whole, I was gonna say the whole world, but the whole universe. Just out of that good pleasure. God, this good pleasure. Now, what do you need to do if you're an adult son or daughter uh, and uh, you want to be involved in the Father's business? There's two things you need. First of all, you have to have access to the Father's riches. You have to have the resources. You have to have the provisions. And the second thing you need is you need to know the Father's plan. You need to know the Father's will. You need to know what the Father's plan is. Uh, if you're going to go out and, and advance God's plan, you, what do you need to know? You need to know what the plan is. And guess what he's going to give us in the next couple verses. Now, how is all this possible? Go down to verse 7. Well, I guess we, we shouldn't omit the end of verse 6 because that's an amazing uh, part there too. The end of verse 6 wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. We're accepted before the Father because we're in Christ, in the beloved. Everything's in Christ to the praise of his, or excuse me, verse 7, in whom, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Uh, so here we have, how is all this possible? It's because of the work, uh, the personal work of his son on that cross, uh, the beloved, uh, the beloved son. Uh, that should bring you back to his uh, various times in the Gospels, like his baptism and the transfiguration and places like that. Uh, his beloved son. We're in the beloved son. We're, we are sons in the beloved son. That ought to make us uh, kind of perk up with excitement. Uh, the son, and we've been brought into God's families heirs and co-heirs with Christ uh, as sons and daughters, adult sons and daughters. Uh, and all of this is made possible through uh, the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that's where we're accepted. Uh, that's where redemption is found for enemy sinners, sinners uh, that no longer, and he no longer holds sins against our account. Uh, that's where we find the riches of his grace. Let's keep reading. Verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Redemption, remember, just generally we'll spend more time with this when we're going down to the details where redemption is be set free. We were enslaved, enslaved to sin and death and Satan and, uh, here's the big one, self. And we were enslaved to all that. His redemption on that cross set us free. Love, 
sets us free from uh, self, our enslavement to self, that death on the cross sets us free from sin and death and Satan. Uh, and the big thing in the book of Ephesians, those powers, those evil powers and principalities that try to influence, that we're set, we're set free from all that. But we're not just set free to avoid, we're set free to serve God. It's really the term liberty freedom to serve uh, and we're made free uh, and this he says here through the forgiveness of sins he's no longer holding sins against us in Christ according to the riches of his grace so there we have remember when I said if you're brought into God's family as adult uh, sons uh, and daughters and the expectation is you can immediately start uh, participating in the father's business well here you have the riches here you have the access to the riches of the Father, your fully provision, the all blessings back in verse 3. Remember, we're going to keep tying this back to verse 3. He's opening up verse 3. Verse 3 is like a bud, and by the time you get to verse 14, it's an open flower. And he's just going to keep expanding and expanding. So now we are brought into that as predetermined uh, when he saves us, uh, it, I, he didn't predetermine who wouldn't and wouldn't be saved, but all believers in the dispensation of grace are now placed in Christ, members of his body, part of the body of Christ, as members of the body of Christ, uh, and brought into his family as adult sons and daughters, and we get access to the riches of the Father through the cross work of Christ. But we need something else. I mentioned this just a couple minutes ago on the last slide. You need something else to participate in the Father's business. You need more than just the riches. The riches are good. I'm not belittling the riches. You need the riches just as much. That's where most of historic Christianity ends. They stop with the riches of grace that come from the cross. But there's a big problem with that. If you have the riches of, of the Father, but you don't know what the plan is, what are you going to do with his riches? You're just going to waste them. You're just going to throw them away. Not, when you're given access to the riches, uh, he also gives us access to the plan. He also gives us the instruction book. Uh, he, and unfortunately, most of Christianity, I'm talking about believing Christianity, uh, because they've thrown away Paul's distinct apostleship, they don't know what the Father's plan is. They at least believe enough to know the riches they get from the cross work of Christ. They believe in Pauline, the Paul's gospel, the good news of the death and, uh, and resurrection of Christ, burial and resurrection of Christ. Uh, they're saved, and they stop there. They have the riches, but they don't know the plan. And they spend their whole life just whittling away the riches, not making use of them, throwing them away, uh, and whittling them down. God, in the very next verse, he's going to take care of the second problem. Now he's giving you all the riches that come through the cross work of Christ. Now you know what he's going to do next? He's going to give you the plan so you know how to use the riches. Verse 8, wherein... He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. What did he, the abounding here is kind of like a, a levee or a dam breaking open, bursting forth. All the water gushes out. He bursts forth now uh, with the divine counsel of the triune Godhead uh, in all wisdom and prudence. And what is this bursting forth of the wisdom and prudence of God uh, for us today in the, in the body of Christ? Verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. That's the plan. Yes, God the Son went to that cross uh, and provided the riches of grace, uh, the riches of the Father, gave us access to the riches of the Father through that uh, Christ and his cross work. And now he gives us, uh, through the Apostle Paul, the risen Lord Jesus Christ uh, comes and he reveals to Paul what the plan is. He reveals to Paul how to use the riches. And he says it's called the mystery. A mystery is just a secret. 
Uh, it's the secret uh, that was kept a secret uh, but is now revealed. A mystery is just something that was secret before, but now it's been revealed. It's not hocus pocus. It's not something deep, dark, and mysterious that no one can figure out. As a matter of fact, he's going to tell us in Ephesians 3, he expects everyone to know it. It's not hard. It's, not, it's just something God didn't reveal till he revealed it to the risen Lord Jesus Christ, revealed it to Paul. So you have this two aspects of the provision of God. One, through the cross work of Christ, he provided the riches of the Father, and through the risen Lord Jesus Christ, returned uh, to Paul and revealed to him the program that was in place, the instruction book for today, the God's will and plan for today. So now you need both things to be able to uh, operate in a way that's well-pleasing to God. Yes, you have to know the riches of grace. You have to know the riches made possible to us uh, of the Father through the work of Christ on that cross. But you need more than riches. You need to know how to use the riches. And that comes through the super abounding wisdom and prudence and having made known unto us the mystery of his will, the secret of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed, pur purposed in himself. Uh, and so not only do we have the riches uh, of grace, and here I for almost forgot, I can't uh, leave this. I, I didn't come up with this basic thing, but I think I did turn it into the poem. Uh, which makes it really special. So here's my poem. Uh, I didn't come up with the exact phraseology, but I think I created the poem. Grace is all that God is free to do for you and me because of what his son did on the cross of Calvary. Now that's about as poetic as I get. Uh, so, but maybe that will help you remember a little. That's what grace is. Everything that Christ did on that cross made available to us. Uh, all the riches of the Father. But you see, that's not enough. You also need to know how to use the riches. And that's uh, because his grace is super abounded to us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery secret of the Father's will. Uh, this is where most of Christianity, believing Christianity, stops. They stop with this, and then they just go off and have no idea what God's doing and are trying to get him to do things he said he's not doing, and uh, they don't recognize the things he is doing, and they just go off uh, and uh, go off on their own. Uh, you need to know what the plan is. You need to know what God is doing. You need to know what the blessings are that God is giving. You need to know those things uh, if you're going to serve him. You've been set free through that redemption, uh, set free from everything against us, set free to serve the Father. You've been provisioned with all the riches of the Father. Now you need to know the Father's plan. And the risen Lord Jesus Christ, after his cross work, he died, buried, resurrected, ascended, and he came back uh, not to do what Peter thought he was going to do or Stephen thought he was going to do. Hey, he, they were expecting Jesus to return and destroy their enemies and save his friends. Instead, the risen Lord Jesus Christ came back, put God's prophetic program with Israel on hold, came back and raised up Paul, saving his worst enemy and telling him to take out salvation to a world of enemies, a day of amnesty, a day of salvation. Uh, and that's what he's doing today, this mystery program, and he's using this dispensation of grace to populate, create a new redeemed humanity. And we'll see what the purpose of that is in the next one, uh, in the next slide. Uh, and so now get the triune Godhead. This is all because it pleased him to bring us into the eternal counsels of the triune Godhead. You know, sometimes we wish we could be in various people's councils, maybe our bosses, maybe the president's, maybe someone else's. Uh, but here, God is going to bring us into his eternal counsel. And he's going to tell us what his plan is. He's going to tell us what his will is, what his counsel is, what his plan is, what he purposed in himself uh, in eternity past and is now implementing uh, through the body of Christ, us, us in Christ. He chose 
us in Christ to carry out this purpose, this body of Christ. All right, so let's keep going with this overview. We're expanding on verse 3. We're opening it up here. Chose us in Christ because that's where everything is. That's where we're set apart for God's service. That's where we're blameless, have a right standing before God. Uh, and he places us in the body of Christ as adult sons and daughters. And then he fully provisions us in the next verses with the riches of the grace made possible through the cross of Christ and the riches of knowledge made possible through the revelation of Christ to the Apostle Paul. And we read about that specifically in the beginning of chapter 3. We won't turn there, though. All right, so let's keep going here, the overview. So we're fully equipped. We know what the Father's plan is. Uh, now let's take it a step further uh, and look at why are these blessings spiritual and heavenly. You know, you know, see, your flesh doesn't really want spiritual and heavenly. Your flesh wants physical and earthly. That's why Paul makes a big point out here. These aren't the things that are going to appeal to your flesh. These are things that appeal to the spirit. And the question is now, back to verse 3, why are they spiritual heavenly blessings and not physical earthly blessings? So let's take a look at that, verse 10. Because that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, when uh, time reaches its end goal for being created, or God creating it, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So now we have God's ultimate end goal uh, for history and time uh, and creation. He's going to uh, bring everything together under him. He's going to have a perfectly working universe. Now here's the thing. He just told us the secret of his will. When you look in verse 11, excuse me, in verse 10, where it says, uh, and which are on earth, uh, was the, his reestablishment of his glory on earth a secret? No, it wasn't. It's been revealed since Adam. Uh, it's, he's been revealing that. He's Peter uh, Zacharias, under, when he's prophesying according to the Spirit at the birth of Christ. Uh, Peter, when he's talking about what's happening at Pentecost, he said the things that are happening now in Christ's earthly ministry uh, and the things happening at Pentecost under Peter and the Twelve, all those things that are happening at that point have been spoken about since the world began. They've been revealed since the world began. So it's not a mystery, right? If it's been revealed since the world began, then it was not a secret. So when you get to this verse, you, if you're thinking, remember, Paul wants us to think. He, we're not just here to recite uh, and then go away thinking we've done something. Uh, he wants us to think. If his reestablishes glory on earth has always been known, then that's not part of the secret. That's not part of the mystery. What he's telling Paul now is he's revealing something else that he kept secret. And that's the, the first part of this verse where it says, he might gather together, together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven. Now that's something he never mentioned before. That's the secret. He's going to do something to reestablish his glory in the heavenlies. What he's going to do on earth has always been revealed. Peter and Zacharias and everyone else says that was spoken about since the world began. But now God's going to reveal something else to Paul that he's, Paul's going to say is something that was kept secret since the world began. Romans 16, 25, Ephesians 3, 1 to 11. Something that wasn't known before the secret. Uh, and that's what brings this out here. This is why the, the blessings are spiritual and heavenly. God's ultimate plan not only had an aspect that was spoken about since the world began, that's how he's going to reestablish his glory on earth uh, with the nation of Israel through his prophetic program. But there's another program. God has another purpose, another program, another people. And that is what he's revealing uh, now through the apostleship of Paul. Uh, he has another aspect that was kept secret since the world began, uh, and that is to reestablish his glory in the heavenlies through another group of redeemed humanity called the body of Christ. Uh, and we see that 
uh, in Romans 16, 25, in the first verses of Ephesians 3 especially, all throughout Paul's writings, but especially there. In Romans 16, 25, Paul's especially, and in the book of Romans as a whole, he's especially emphasizing the mystery. Ephesians is going to especially emphasize the heavenlies. This mystery program for the body of Christ uh, is going to reestablish his glory in the heavenly. See, that's something no one would have thought of. No one would have any problem guessing that God was going to reestablish his glory on earth through humanity. But what no one would guess is that he's also going to reestablish his glory in the heavenlies through another group of redeemed humanity called the body of Christ. His group for redeemed humanity to reestablish his glory on earth is the nation of Israel, believing Israel. Uh, his group for reestablishing his glory in the heavenlies is the body of Christ. Uh, and we'll see how that comes as we go through the passage uh, verse by verse. So that brings us now. So we have these two aspects here. That's why the, the blessings are spiritual and heavenly. Because our job isn't to reestablish God's glory on earth, the physical earthly realm, uh, were to reestablish his glory in the heavenlies, the spiritual heavenly realm. Therefore, the spiritual and heavenly blessings of Ephesians 1, 3. They're in Christ because God chose us in Christ, the body of Christ, to carry out this program. Uh, and it's there that we're fully provisioned with the riches of the Father, and we're fully provisioned with the riches of the knowledge of what he's doing. And he, it's there that we can understand his whole purpose for the universe being brought together through these two programs, two peoples, uh, to form a universe. And I just kind of think of it as a clock. You know, when you look at a clock, it looks like one perfectly working clock, right? But if you open the door, what do you see inside? These two or three, some of us have three, I'm just going to keep it two. Three, two little wheels going. See, that's the way... He, the universe is going to work one day, according to verse 10 here. It's going to be a whole universe working in perfect accord. And if you could open the front of the universe, you'd see two wheels running. His mystery program for the body of Christ to reestablish his glory in the heavenly spiritual realm. His earthly, oh, I can't coordinate my fingers now if I try to do it separate. This is hard work up here. <laughs> so I'll stop twirling my fingers. Uh, but the the lower wheel is going to be displaying how he uh, reestablishes glory on earth through the nation of Israel. And when both of those programs, when it reaches the dispensation of the fullness of times, both of those programs are going to be working in complete unity. He's going to shut the front of the universe, uh, the face of the universe, shut the, the front of it, and you'll see a universe operating in perfect accord with the one true God, his purpose for creating uh, the whole universe. All right, so let's now, let's finish off this section, this review, uh, and look at Ephesians. Let's fin pick it up at verse 11. In whom also uh, we have received, uh, obtained an inheritance. So now we're back to Ephesians 1.3. All those spiritual blessings. Uh, here we're back to Ephesians 1.3. It is the inheritance. Uh, and we have here an inheritance uh, being predestinated. We're back to predestination unto sonship according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory. So now we have because uh, that in Christ all who believe have obtained uh, the inheritance uh, in accord. That's out of all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in verse 3. In accord with our predetermined sonship position to fulfill the mystery uh, the mystery aspect of his will. That's why we're here. That's why uh, just having the riches of God isn't enough. We have to know what we're supposed to use the riches for. And when we understand what our job is, what the Father's plan is, why he created this new group of humanity called the body of Christ, uh, we'll understand how to use his riches uh, and will be successful uh, fruitful, I guess would be the best word, fruitful ambassadors of God down here on earth. Uh, and all this is just to the praise of his glory. 
everything he's doing with us is to turn a bunch of sinners, uh, dead sinners, enslaved to sin, death, self, uh, the powers, uh, uh, the evil, wicked, evil power, all that stuff, all you, we were in Adam, and he's now saving them and making them the reflectors of his glory, not just on earth, but in the heavenlies. And you know what this did to the Lord? What it did to the triune Godhead? This brought him pleasure. He just got pleasure out of it. Look what I did with these human, this human, fallen human creation. I turned them into the reflectors of my glory. Awesome, uh, amazing uh, that he wouldn't just psh, wipe us off the earth. Uh, instead, he's going to turn us into willing, loving vessels of his glory. Those who had no glory become the reflectors of his glory. If you need a better reason than that for getting up in the morning, I don't think you're going to find one because that's as high as you can get. That's the best, uh, that's the best uh, purpose to have in the whole universe. Uh, and then let's just finish off the section here. In verse 13, in whom you also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you heard, uh, that you believed, uh, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise, again, unto the praise of his glory. Uh, so once we're saved, he seals us with that Holy Spirit of promise, uh, and that's the, debt, that's the down payment of our inheritance. Uh, we have everything up in verse 3. He said he gave us, in past tense, all spiritual blessings. Now they belong to us in Christ. Uh, but there's still one uh, that we have already, but we don't experience now. The one we're really looking forward to. Romans 8 talks about this too. And that's what he calls here the redemption of the purchased possession. What uh, Romans 8 is going to call that resurrection of the body uh, when we have a body like unto his. Uh, and especially, <laughs> we're all going to like this, without indwelling sin a body like unto his, glorified, uh, and especially equipped and optimized for service in the heavenly realm, where we'll be the displayers of his glory. Uh, and again, it's just, to the, it's just so we can praise, we can be to the praise of his glory. He just did it for his good pleasure. Look what I did with these people, this fallen creation. Look what I did with them. And that's going to radiate his glory and display his grace throughout uh, all eternity, all everlasting future. It's the most important thing, uh, not just in the world, but in the universe. So by the time you get to end of this section, you've had God the Father in the first few verses came up with this plan in eternity past. Think as way back as you can possibly do. Uh, and then God the Son... Uh, he made this all possible through his cross work uh, and the cross and his cross work in, the, in, in 2,000 years ago in this dispensation of grace in the now, the but now. And God, the Holy Spirit, uh, sealed it and it guaranteed it for uh, the everlasting future. You feel insecure sometimes? Well, think about that. You've been swept up into the life of the triune Godhead and it's never going to be taken away. It's eternally secure, forevermore, guaranteed. God came, the, God came up with an eternity past. He's carried it out in this dispensation of grace, and he's going to keep it uh, into the everlasting future. As secure as you can get, as secure as God himself. All right, so there's the forest again. Hopefully, each time I go over the forest, these first uh, 14 verses, I keep adding more stuff. So if you've kind of been uh, building along, you'll see it, it's getting more fuller uh, as we go along here. So now let's go back and look at some of the trees. Let's look at some of the trees here. We covered verse 4 last time, so I'm just going to state briefly, and I want to use an example uh, that uh, I didn't use last time here, 
uh, in the message, but I did in my email article I sent out. So I just wanted to kind of mention that here too to get it in the slide. So chose us in Christ. Uh, it doesn't say he chose us to be in Christ. Uh, he didn't, it doesn't say he chose who would and wouldn't be in Christ. It says he chose us in Christ. And I got a real practical example if you still don't quite hear it. He chose that everyone uh, in Christ, all who freely believe in the dispensation of grace, uh, not, he didn't choose them to believe, he chose all who freely believe in the dispensation of grace. And what he chose about them is that he's going to place them in his vehicle of service called the body of Christ. Not, and the point is here, if you're cho what does the word choose have to do with? What do you need uh, in order to use the word choose? What do you need? You need at least two things, right? Uh, maybe many things, but you need at least two things. Otherwise, there's no choice. If there's just one thing, there's no choice. You do the one thing. He chose us, uh, and what Paul and God's and Paul's point here is not, he hasn't elected and selected and chose people to be saved or not to be saved, to believe or not believe, or uh, any of that kind of theological mumbo-jumbo nonsense. This passage has nothing to do with salvation, what we normally consider, talk about with salvation. This passage has to do with service. This passage has to do with what he does with those he's already saved. And his point here, this choosing concept, you got to have at least two, his choosing concept here, he's making known, God and Paul are making known that when we be freely believed and were placed in the body of Christ, uh, he didn't, uh, placed in Christ, well, he didn't place us in the nation of Israel, believing Israel. That would have been, that was his choice in the God's prophetic program with Israel. Uh, he placed us in the body of Christ, his chosen vessel for the mystery program. That's the choice. And the worst thing we can do is to confuse, to think when we got saved, we were placed in Israel and not in the body of Christ. The worst thing we can do is think that they're basically the same thing. The worst thing we can do is say the body of Christ has replaced the nation of Israel. The worst thing we can do if we want to ruin our service to God is to say we're the new Israel, uh, the spiritual Israel, uh, the reworked, rehashed Israel. Israel totally messed up. God threw her away permanently, and he's replacing it with us little wonderful flowers. Uh, because we'll do so much better than they did. Uh, and it's just a bunch of, you see, that's just theological mumbo jumbo. Uh, people, theologians with big brains and get paid big bucks to make their theological system seem to be in accord with God's word when it's really contrary to it. That's what most of historic Christianity has done. The very thing Paul is trying to point out here is that when we believed we weren't placed into the nation of Israel in any way, shape, or form, we're not new Israel, spiritual Israel, rehashed Israel, any kind of Israel. Israel's program has been set aside temporarily. It'll restart uh, in the future, and he'll pick up right where he left off. We're a new group of redeemed humanity called the body of Christ, and everyone who believes in the dispensation of grace are placed in the body of Christ, not in the nation of Israel. Contrary to what 2,000 years of historic Christianity says, even most of believing Christianity says uh, we've replaced Israel, we're new Israel, spiritual Israel, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but we're not, his Paul, uh, Paul's point here is not who and doesn't who does and doesn't get saved. Uh, it's not that he's talking here about what God does with those he's saved, and he's not placing us in any way, no matter how a theologian tries to spin it, uh, in any way associated with Israel's pro, nation of Israel. Uh, we're placed into the body of Christ. We have a special group, a new group of redeemed humanity with a special purpose, special instructions, uh, special everything uh, that comes along with that. Uh, and so he chose what he would do with all who believe in the dispensation of grace, and that's put them in the body of Christ, not the nation of Israel. And uh, if you still don't hear it in here, I got uh, a quite a bit of response on this example, so I'll throw it up again in case anyone didn't get the email. Uh, 
the example is in 2013, seven years. Now, just remember, we're talking about God in eternity past chose some stuff. Well, now just kind of keep that same framework. Here we have the Olympic Committee seven years before the 2020 Olympics. And uh, they uh, chose that Tokyo would be, the, in 2013, they chose the city of Tokyo to be the host, to be their servant, to be their vessel of service uh, in 2020. Seven years before, they chose that. Uh, and when the announcer uh, put this, the newcaster, newscaster, he was Japanese and he's broadcasting, he was broadcasting in English, uh, but he, was in, he must have lived in Tokyo because he said, uh, the, when he went to announce this news, he said the Olympic Committee has chosen us in Tokyo to host the Olympics, to be its vehicle of service, uh, setting us apart. And what did that do? That set the Tokyo apart from any other city. Uh, and it's uh, to carry out their service in hosting the games. Now, what did the newscaster certainly, what did he not mean by that statement? He most certainly did not mean the Olympic Committee chose every single individual that was going to be in Tokyo at the time of the games. We just laughed. That's ridiculous. Of course the Olympic Committee didn't do that. What, are they, what was he saying? He, the Olympic Committee chose everyone that's living in Tokyo at that time is going to be their servant in their service for hosting uh, the games. So now take that to the, our passage here in Ephesians. Chose us in Christ. Uh, he didn't choose us in Christ. It doesn't mean God chose every individual that's going to be in Christ. What it means is he chose us, uh, chose us in Christ, everyone that's living in, the, in Christ, in this dispensation of grace, is going to be members of his body, the body of Christ, and fulfilling of his secret uh, mystery, the mystery of his will. Uh, to reestablish his glory in the heavenlies. Not the nation of Israel to reestablish his glory on earth and his prophetic program. We're part of his mystery program to reestablish his glory in the heavenlies through the body of Christ. Two distinct uh, purposes, sub-purposes, I guess you could say. Two distinct programs, two distinct peoples. And the minute uh, you take the riches of grace and try to bring them into God's prophetic program with Israel, it's just confusion. It's what historic Christianity has become. Just confusion, just running around. No one knows what's going on. Uh, I just talked to someone this last week that goes to a mainline church, and she was just told me, you can't know the will of God. It's deep, dark, and mysterious. And I'm like, yes, you can. I'll show you where it is if you want. And I did. I don't know if it made uh, any, was any help to her or not, but I hope so. So God... Too. So too, God has chosen us, the whole body of Christ uh, as a whole, not the nation of Israel. That's Paul's point here. That's God and Paul's point. We're not the nation of Israel. So, of course, what is most of historical? They come along and say we are, in one way or another, the nation of Israel. Uh, he's the whole, they miss the whole point here. And then to try and, I mean, you can't just throw away the verses, right? So you throw away what God and Paul intended, and you fill it up with your own meaning. Uh, that's called theological systems, uh, filling it up with this election and choosing and predestination, all this kind of mumbo, theological mumbo-jumbo that has absolutely nothing to do with what God and Paul are talking about here. He didn't choose, uh, uh, let's finish this, to be set apart holy, this is all in verse 4, blamelessly serving him, carrying out his plan and purpose for today in love. See, that very end phrase is enough to get rid of all that junk that theologians talk about because uh, it has to be in love. You can't choose somebody to love you. You can't force somebody to love you. You can select a person, but you can't necessarily select them to love you. God isn't going to force someone to be involved and to receive and to be involved in his love. It has to come freely through believing in what his, the display of that love at the cross of Christ and receiving it uh, by believing, by grace, through faith. He's going to say that uh, in Ephesians 3 as well. You can't force someone. See, that, that one phrase throws away all that theological nonsense. 
You can't force someone to love. This is all in love. These are people who have freely chosen uh, to believe in the personal work of his son on that cross and receive it unto themselves uh, by grace through faith. And those are the ones he places into Christ, into the body of Christ. Uh, and today in this dispensation of grace, he's using that body of Christ uh, to reestablish his glory in the heavenlies, which was his secret purpose, his secret will, his mystery program that's now revealed. He didn't choose select every individual, uh, every individual that comes along here who would be in Christ uh, he chose that all those who were already living in Christ as members of his body, the body of Christ, would be set apart for his service. The reestablishes glory in the heavenlies, setting it apart from all other in Christ groups, uh, specifically the nation of Israel. Remember to choose, you've got to have at least two. Uh, and so God predetermined in eternity past uh, that he would reclaim the heavenly and earthly realms uh, and he's going to do it through two chosen groups of redeemed humanity. Again, that doesn't mean he's picking every individual that's going to be in each group. That's the Tokyo example. He's chosen the vehicle of service. In his prophetic program of the nation of Israel, the vehicle of service is the nation of Israel. In his and he came up with that in eternity past. That was one choice. Uh, and then in eternity past, he also came up with another group of redeemed humanity, another vessel of service called the body of Christ. And he predetermined in eternity past that he was going to use the nation of Israel in his prophetic program uh, to reestablish his glory on earth. And he's going to use the body of Christ in his mystery program to reestablish his glory in the heavenlies. And that's what Paul's going to expand upon through the whole rest of the book of Ephesians. In his prophetic program, God's chosen in Christ vessel, his uh, sp special group of redeemed humanity, his vehicle of service to reestablish his glory on earth would be the nation of Israel, made up mostly of believing Israelites and believing Gentiles associated with them. Uh, and we won't time, take time to look up these verses, but Deuteronomy 6 and 7 talks about how God chose not individual Jews to be in the nation of Israel. He chose the nation of Israel, uh, believing Israel, to be his special, peculiar treasure. And here uh, in Deuteronomy 7, 6 and 7, the nation of Israel is going to be above all other nations. And then if you look at uh, Psalm 135, you'll see the nation of Israel's God is going to be all above all other gods, small g, gods. Uh, and he brings that out there. In his mystery program, however, so here you have one program that God came up with in eternity past. His prophetic program uh, to, with the nation of Israel to reestablish his glory on earth. But God had another program that he, now the one for earth he revealed when the earth was created. The, but the, he had another plan that he put in a drawer. He went down to the deepest, darkest vault in heaven, opened a, a vault, opened up a drawer, put it in there, shut the vault, locked it all up, and left it there until he revealed it to the apostle Paul. And that is how God's chosen, has another chosen group, uh, an in Christ group called of redeemed humanity, his vehicle of service uh, to reestablish his glory in the heavenlies uh, is his body, the body of Christ, uh, made up mostly of believing Gentiles and believing Jews as well. That's Paul's point in verse 4 and verse 5, and really the whole book of Ephesians. Don't go back to God's prophetic program with the nation of Israel to find the instructions for those, uh, for us involved in God's mystery program as members of the body of Christ. The two instruction pa uh, plans aren't going to work. They're two different uh, plans. There's two different sets of instructions to mix them together. Uh, you can see how subtle uh, Satan's deception is. That's what he's gotten most of historic Christianity to do. Mix that all together so nobody knows really anything that's going on. If you mix it up really good, guess what happens? You, you'll even throw away Paul's gospel and you won't even get saved. That's what Satan really wants. But that's okay. He says if you end up getting saved through the cross work of Christ, well then I'm going to mix it up some more so you don't know how to serve God down here on earth. 
If I can't keep you from getting saved by mixing up all this, I'll keep you from serving God in a way that pleases him. Big loss to stop with that. All right, so in his prophetic program, in, excuse me, in his mystery program, uh, that's what he's doing. That's Paul, what Paul's bringing out here. That's what Paul is going to develop and the whole rest of the, of the book. All right, I was going to go on to verse 5 with predestination, but I guess it'd be best uh, just to, because I think it's a little more than I can cover here. So we'll start that with predestination, verse 5, uh, next week. Let's close with a word of prayer.